Hey everyone, welcome to a brand new SPSM chat, SPSM Suicide Prevention Social Media. I'm Rudy Caceres, at Rudy Caceres on Twitter, and today, tonight if you will, we're talking about camouflaging distress, hashtag actually autistic suicide risk, and we have two awesome guests on, Lydia XE Brown and Shane. I'm I, I, I'm a bad host, so I didn't go through the homework of asking for the pro correct pronunciation, so I'm not going to butcher it and have them pronounce it, and therefore we all win and look smart. So before we get to that, if you're watching this live, please let us know that you're here, let us know that you care, let us know that you are alive. By using that hashtag SPSM, if you're on Twitter, if you're on Facebook, Mixer, or YouTube, we want to hear from you as well. We can put your comments on screen. We can make you part of the conversation. If you're on Twitter, make sure to follow along on the Twitter chat. We have four questions going. Uh, the first one should go up at about five minutes and then 10 minutes intervals thereafter. I mean, we got one comment already. See, Danielle Glick, one of our co-hosts who is currently on assignment right now, she cares, she's here, and God damn it, she's alive. Let's go around our round rectangle of co-hosts, starting with the person that I care about the most. Sorry, I was not uh, prepared. My name is Joelle Marie. Um, I am a peer specialist. I was certified in Massachusetts. Um, I am also an SPSM coach and coach host. I like and that. I, I'm an SPSM coach. Um, and I am actually autistic and also have OCD and I'm bipolar. So, uh, but I'm really excited about this conversation because, uh, you know, suicide is an issue that is typically overlooked and not dealt with in a supportive way in the autism community. And it needs to be. Take it away, Hudson. Hi, I'm Hudson Harris, the person Rudy Caceres actually loves most. Uh, I'm a behavioral health systems designer, and I have a, a son with uh, some special sensory issues. And so I am very excited uh, for uh, talking tonight and to share some of my experiences and to learn as well. Um, I'm in sunny San Diego, and I uh, can't wait to talk to everybody tonight. Awesome, and I'm glad you're here. It's been a while since we've had you on, so thank you, thank you. Thank you so busy saving the world. Tell the whole world, speaking of the world, who is Lydia XZ Brown? This is Lydia. My pronouns are they, them, or just my name, Lydia. I'm an attorney, an advocate, a community organizer, an educator, a speaker, and a writer. Currently, I'm at the Georgetown Law Center's Institute for Tech Law and Policy. I co-lead a research project on disability rights and algorithmic fairness. I teach as adjunct faculty for Georgetown University's Disability Studies Program, and I'm Policy and Advocacy Associate for the Autistic Woman and Non-Binary Network. My current passion project is the Fund for Community Reparations for Autistic People of Color's Interdependence, Survival, and Empowerment, or the Autistic People of Color Fund for short. I'm the founder and director of this fund, which gives out microgrants to individual autistic people of color. And I am joining you from the middle of nowhere in the state of Maryland. And let's take it away to our next guest of honor. Hi, my name is Shane Newmeyer, um, and I can totally understand how that mess of vowels is not um, easily pronounceable. So no, no problem. I've had um, worse. <laughs> I, I am a an attorney as well, but right now I am one of the massive people unemployed. So not any to work these days. Um, and I'm also autistic, but my brain is basically a giant blob of neurodivergence, which may or may not just be lots of PTSD on top of autism, or maybe five plus different things who even knows anymore. Um, but, uh, nice to talk to everybody tonight. Yes, I'm glad to have you all on here. And before we get into our first question, um, I'm trying to pin the uh, live stream to the Rudy, top of the... Um, yes, yes, while I'm trying to pin the live streams to the top of the Twitter feed, yes, please interrupt. I just want to say how nice it is to have a majority of attorneys on the show for the first time. As a fellow attorney, uh, Shane and Lydia, it's very nice to have like a little bit of camaraderie and not just people yell at me for being an attorney, so. 
That's all. Well, I appreciate it as well. Before we get into our first question, uh, going back to the title, hashtag actually autistic, uh, this question goes for Lydia and Shane. Break it down. What's the meaning behind the hashtag and why it's so important? Let's go to Lydia. With many disability communities, it's very common for non-disabled people to treat everyone around us who isn't actually disabled as the real expert. And that's very true in particular for psych disabled people and for developmentally disabled people. And one of the ways that shows up is that a lot of non-disabled folks will assume that the autism community means parents who are not autistic of autistic children, teachers who are not autistic of autistic students, therapists who are not autistic, of aut autistic clients, and so on, but never of people who are actually autistic ourselves. So that hashtag comes from a long tradition in disability rights and self-advocacy movement spaces of, of the slogan, nothing about us without us. If something is about autistic people, then people who are actually autistic belong at the center of and leading that conversation and not people who just happen to be connected to us. Um, if I might add to that, one of the other things that uh, is the case, unfortunately, is that people will talk because of that perception, like we're not even in the room, like nobody autistic could actually be possibly listening to what Steve said about us. Um, in the audience, it's presumably a dialogue of NTs by NTs about autistic people and saying, hi, I'm in the room and I'm actually autistic is a reminder to people, like, don't presume that you're talking about some abstract group over here. Here we are part of this dialogue and people don't expect us to be. They don't even expect us to be autistic when they speak to us because usually they're image of an autistic person in eight-year-old or so white child um, doing something stereotypical like playing with a train or flapping their hands, not somebody who may flap their hands as an adult, sometimes may not, maybe any number of uh, members of any community stick to the stereotypes of what we look like move like, talk like, etc. So it's a reminder to people that autistic people present in a variety of different ways and to assume part of the community and the, the audience as much as anyone else. I really appreciate the clarification there. And before we get on to question number one, let me just give some quick shout outs. First to Twitter, Rob, who is an MSW student uh, at Ohio University. Thank you. Uh, to Lynn, also coming from OU. And Joelle, who is, I know, is very excited about tonight's topic. Okay, quick shout outs again to uh, Salty Meg, who is here every week, no matter what. I appreciate that. And Margaret French. So, question number one. One, and that would be, drum roll please, how might autistic camouflaging or attempting to camouflage contribute to the stress? Take it away, Lydia. We spend our entire lives being told directly or indirectly that we're broken, we're defective, we're shitty and less human versions of neurotypical people. And that's only amplified when we are also marginalized in other ways, whether or not we have a word for it or we know names to describe who and what we are and what communities might offer a sense of home for us. And, and that's true, whether the autistic person in question is someone that everyone just sort of intuitively knows there's something different about them, or if they're an autistic person that a lot of people wouldn't necessarily think, oh, that's an autistic person, but they might think that person's a little weird or that person's not the same as me. And we're told whether it's by therapists or by our parents or by teachers that, you know, we have to fix ourselves. We have to learn how to pretend to be neurotypical, how to make eye contact, how to do social skills or conversation the way that neurotypical people do. And that if we don't do that and not only do it in the way that neurotypical people do, 
but according to the same standards that apply to white people, to educated people, to people with degrees, to straight people, and somehow do all of that, then it's our fault if someone decides to bully us or if we don't get a job or if we end up being evicted from somewhere or we end up being abused by someone. And it's, it's means that so for many of us, trying to mask or camouflage is an act of survival. And it's something that's not possible for everyone to do, or even for those people for whom it is possible to do, at least sometimes, it's not often possible to keep it up constantly. And it's draining, it's exhausting, it is isolating, and it's it's something that wears on a person. It takes an enormous amount of energy, and it, it ultimately contributes to what many of us experience as extreme issues of self-esteem. A lot of us have a severe problem with self-hatred. Many of us also have anxiety or depression. Um, I also, like Joelle, I also have OCD. Almost all of us have some form of post-traumatic stress disorder or CPTSD. And when you put that all in one person, then yes, when we are trying to, whether or not we actually succeed, mask or camouflage, it is an extreme tax on us as people. And so naturally it's distressing to remind ourselves that we don't get to count for who we are and that who we are will result in being harmed or punished and that we have to keep trying to adhere to standards that are literally impossible and are harmful in and of themselves. On a base level, we're, we as autistic people are living in a world that is inhospitable to us. Uh, even besides people's attitudes, a lot of things that other people consider foods do not are not food to us. We can try to eat them. We might vomit. We might just not be able to uh, like swallow them at all. A lot of sounds are like somebody taking an ice pick to our eardrums. Uh, a lot of feelings of touch are painful or at least feel threatening. Um, and that only leads to trauma when all these things and more are put on you for year after year, even without bad intention. Then you add how people do respond to you and how, like Lydia said, it is put all on you. And then you have it. You're told if you only did this, that, and the other, you this wouldn't happen to you. You would be successful. You would have friends. You would have a partner. You would get a job. You would it, it, teachers would like you better, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So most people, not all, but a lot of people, do want to be liked and accepted and successful by their society's general standards. So they and we will try our very damnedest to meet that standard, maybe going above and beyond, um, executing it perfectly, and only to realize that it's not enough. We reach adulthood or even just adolescence, and you can, you know, have perfect table manners. You can make concerted eye contact, maybe even a little bit eerily by most people's standard. You can excel academically either through raw ability or through workarounds. You can do all these things, and it's not the A to B kind of thing that you're taught it is. You might not get the result, and in fact, you're being you're, they're likely to pick it out about you anyway that somehow you're not like them. But you can't drop the act. That's forbidden. That's ruled out. It's, it's still expected of you to play the game perfectly, just that you also accept that you can't win being what you are. And it's an enormous amount of stress to deal with the baseline of sensory, physical, whatever you want to call it, difficulty of living in the world and perform at least as good at, as neurotypicals at their social rules or compensate with better than in other ways and it not being enough and you can't put that down ever, how would that not be exhausting? Take it away, Hudson. <laughs> um, I would say my perspective as a, as a parent, um, 
I think mirrors a lot of what uh, Shane and Lydia just said. I mean, hearing things about my son Anders, like doesn't fit in, not classroom ready, uh, can't handle it. Um, and then I think the thing that was always that was always so frustrating was it wasn't enough that he had to uh, try and fit in places where he didn't fit. But it was also that when we tried to get him the services and fought for years to get him the services, things like he's not academically delayed uh, in one state that we lived in, they wouldn't give him services because he wasn't delayed, even though it was patently obvious that he needed an IEP, needed special support um, to help him you know, really thrive. Um, so I, it, it's one of those things where as a parent, it's been, it's been a really interesting journey for me. And like, I think most of the people that know me know that my anger is very low and it takes a lot to get me worked up. But like Anders was, I think, kicked out of six schools before we moved away, moved out of St. Louis. And like, you want to see me rage Panda. Like when people start to, uh, I think try and push some of what I now know is camouflaging on him or things like that. I will absolutely just rend the world because like that type of behavior is unacceptable. And, you know, I work with him a lot now on what are his superpowers to try and like make him feel, um, feel good about the things he can do. Like briefly, like one of my favorite stories about him, the first school he got kicked out of not long after this incident, uh, he was just over two years old and he watched the teacher uh, he knew the process so that the teacher would, would go to the door, she'd undo the child safety knob, then she'd get a key, then she'd unlock it, then she'd put the key away and then push a button and unlock and, and then turn it. And he watched that entire process, learned it, and then let an escape from his classroom of 15 kids. And like they called us into the office and like I could not have been prouder. And she tried to come down on him about, you know, he needs to not be like all this stuff. And I was like, no, no. This was not on him. Like he is doing wonderful, and that's an absolutely wonderful kid who figured out an incredibly complex process. So, yeah. Thank you, Hudson. And let's go to Joelle. You know, I think I have to echo a lot of what everyone else said. Um, it definitely, like it, specifically with you know sensory processing issues. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we're supposed to do um, that don't feel bad or feel harmful or even feel painful for neurotypical people um, that feel horrible for us, but like it's not acceptable if we say, this is not a good thing. Like this doesn't feel good, it feels bad. Um, and that's, that's definitely part of the masking that I've felt I needed to do. Um, Camouflaging and masking has definitely almost led to my death. Um, sorry, the puppy in the background. Um, and it's a lot of it is because, you know, if I express my needs, I'm not expressing them the right way. I'm not using the right words. I'm not using the right tone. I'm not asking politely enough, but like I'm telling you specifically what I need and that's not good enough. And I've been punished for being who I am and stating what I need. Um, and I'm having a lot of distraction issues right now. But generally I'm told I'm not good enough how I am. And when I was finally able to stop um, masking as much, I felt better. I didn't feel as angry. And anger is a really uh, a really harmful internal feeling. It can be physically painful. That's it. Okay, so before we get on to our next question, just wanted to give some quick shout outs to the people across the social networks. So again, uh, Rob says, to, in response to question number one, this is on Twitter, autistic camouflaging contributes to distress because it reinforces the idea that autism is somehow a mistake that needs correction. Lynn says, uh, in response to uh, question number one again, I think Lydia killed that answer. Pretending slash camouflaging only masks the issues that need to be brought up and confronted. This can cause distress because they aren't being who they are and adding to other stresses whilst trying to live up to societal standards. Tom Crook, the social worker students are out in full force tonight. I really appreciate that. Hope you're all staying safe out there. 
To blend, you must bend, twist, and shape yourself into something you aren't so you won't be noticed to what you are than to have this on a daily basis. How could it not be distressing? And uh, thank you for the comments, Rashi and Lynn, also on YouTube as well. That's amazing. So, and we definitely do not ever forget Hudson. So, uh, real quickly, uh, Rashi had a question. What geopolitical forces influence why autistic self-advocacy voices are not heard if uh real quickly before we get on to question number two if lydia or shane will tackle that feel free to um either one or if you want to completely pass that's okay too i'm not sure what exactly is being meant by geopolitical force and forces i i would think it's less about states making decisions um or um, in relationships to each other than it is about how societies across the world see um, difference as a threat or bad, or see the roles and rights of parents regarding children or adults regarding children in general, um, see the importance of, at some level that they might not even realize of conformity of everybody being something that other people recognize what they're looking at and how that person interacts with them. I think that there's a sense of underlying threat when somebody doesn't fit in. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't take the effort, uh, make the effort to push past that um, after really thinking through how that impulse will affect people. Thank you, and hope, hope that adequately addressed your question, Rossi, uh, Rashi. Um, thank you. Feel free to ask more questions, comment. We'll try to we'll try to get to them time permitting, but we have to get on to question number two, and that would be question number two. What are some ways autistics experience help as harm, and what might be some reasons this happens? Let's go back to Shane. Um. A lot of the so-called therapies for autism are about making us more like neurotypical people or really, in fact, making us pretend to be more like neurotypical, often through some level of coercion, anywhere from you don't get to talk about your your special interest, the thing that you care about most in the world and like... It, all you would like to do all day is focus on this. You get to talk about this once. And after you've done eight hours of what we want you to do, and or we're going to take your favorite comfort object and not let you have it back until you comply, all the way to actual electric shock as punishment, which is still going on um, at one particular facility in the U.S. Um, that's uh, that's a formal kind of treatment or education, but in day-to-day -day social interactions, even there's this sense, in general, I guess, treatment and non-treatment of you have to be cruel to be kind, which is, um, if you don't mind me swearing, it's bullshit. It's the idea that if parents and teachers don't get involved to protect their their kids or their students from bullying, maybe the kid will learn to fit in and navigate the social world better. Um, it's the idea that, for instance, um, using, like forcing somebody to eat something that they don't want will expand their diet, even if they experience it as physically excruciating or sickening. It's basically, it's a very, and justify the means kind of approach and like to use a metaphor if i might break the stereotype of autism here um it doesn't really make sense in this context to make an omelet by breaking the egg because the egg is the person that you're trying to make into an omelet and breaking doesn't actually accomplish that so in the process of trying to make the person they want, they do sometimes irreparable damage to the person that already exists. All right, let's take it. Let's take it to Lydia, and feel free to address the previous question. I know I cut you off there. Apologies. 
Great, this is Lydia. My answer to both of the two for our discussion tonight and to the question that came from Rashi is essentially the same, which is that it boils down to ableism. Ableism is a form of structural oppression. That is, it is a set of power differentials in society wherein those who are considered to be healthy and functional and sane and stable and strong and intelligent are granted enormous amount of power in society at the direct expense of everybody who in turn alternately is considered defective, deficient, broken, sick, weak, crazy, or stupid. And how that can play out is everywhere from the facility that Shane mentioned, the Judge Rotenberg Center that shocks people, to the parent ideology behind that, applied behavior analysis, which is the number one most widely funded and touted evidence-based treatment for autism and which nearly every autistic adult that either Shane or I have ever spoken to that was subjected to it while younger now has PTSD as a result of surviving it. And that's a pretty horrifying statistic. But let's pull that out even further. According to another study that came out in the last 10 years or so, as many as 65% of people experiencing homelessness may also be autistic or similarly developmentally disabled. Autistic people and other developmentally disabled people are seven times more likely to be targeted for sexual violence and seven times more likely to be encountering law enforcement. And that's before you disaggregate by race, gender, or sexuality. People who are Black or Native and who are also disabled, which includes autistic people in that category, are the most likely to be targeted for criminalization and for incarceration. And that shows up everywhere from which students are likely to be pulled out of school, suspended, expelled, sent to an alternative school, which people are likely to end up going to prison or jail for literally anything. And when you also look at other statistics that show that, for example, autistic people have higher rates of using substances of various kinds, whether that's weed or it's things that are significantly more mind altering and may develop an addiction from that, which is itself another form of disability. Well, those who are autistic and black or brown are much more likely to be criminalized for that experience, while those who are white and those who are lighter skinned people of color may be substantially less likely to be criminalized in the same way. And yet at the same time, whether an autistic person finds themselves placed under guardianship, sent to a group home, sent to drug rehab, sent to a long-term psychiatric institution, or locked up in prison, the result is the same. In society, we struggle under the weight of all of these systems that are supposed to help or correct or fix or support, but that are actually violent in and of themselves. And it all comes down to ableism, which is in itself a profoundly white supremacist and capitalist ideology. What say you, Hudson Harris? I mean, there's not a whole lot that I can add to what Lydia just said. I mean, I think my experience for my son has been the same. Like the, the knee jerk reaction was always to take him out of the classroom or it was too loud, so get him somewhere else. And it, and it created this uh, self-fulfilling prophecy where he wasn't able to participate. He wasn't able to be a part of things because he was always being pulled out, um, whether it was suspension or getting kicked out or whatever. And it, it's been unbelievably hard on him. It's been terrible. In fact, he's knocking right now. Joel. Sorry, I have to mute and unmute. Um, were we gonna, sorry, I lost the question. Thank you. Um, what are some ways autistics experience health as harm and what might be some reasons this happens? Um, I mean, in, in my case, I've definitely experienced a lot of teaching of etiquette. And um, I mean, it's, it's interesting to go through that. It's, I suppose sometimes it's nice to have, but to be, for it to be emphasized as better than who I am or how I act normally inherently is, is kind of crushing. Um, there's also been a lot of, you know, from what I've heard from other people and for me that the way that we inherently cope is not okay. So these, these are skills that we've developed ourselves and a lot of it is stimming or, or pattern seeking or routine. There's nothing wrong with trying to have a routine. And when, in my experience, when I've expressed that I need things a certain place or I get very upset and then they're moved, like it's my fault. 
Um, I think that a lot of people have definitely told me to change how I behave, my mannerisms, um, how I'm looking at people, the words that I use, and that doesn't help me. It, it has never helped me function better in the world. It's only given me more stress and made me feel shame and it's been painful. And once I started to kind of reject those things, I started to have a little more sense of control over myself and what I need to do to cope with the world. I'm done. Oh, all right. Okay, um, so, oh, do you have something to say, Shay? Yeah, I had um, a couple of things to add. One of the sure. other things that people try to do is help but is actually counterproductive to say the least. And this is not unique to autism. A lot of people with different disability experiences experience this um, is the, why don't you just phenomenon? Why don't you just think happy thoughts and not be so negative? Why don't you just try it and maybe you'll like it? Something like that, that is, it compounds the original, it's insult to injury because not only is it failing to validate your pain, it's saying, oh, it's so easy to not feel this way. Why don't you just do this completely obvious um, thing that surely you've never thought of and you wouldn't have done if, if you could. I mean, just flip the light switch. Just don't experience that difficulty anymore, right? Um, it's a profound lack of empathy, which is all the more inexcusable for the fact that neurotypical people claim a monopoly on empathy, especially as against autistic people. All right, so let's get straight into question number three, because I know we got a lot to cover. If you're leaving awesome comments on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube and Mixer, I see you. And just know that we'll try to give as many shout outs and address as many questions as we get along. But I want to make sure we get to the four questions first and foremost. Question number three. How might different models of disability and identity factor into extreme distress or suicidality in the autistic population? Let's go back to Shane. Um, so I don't know how much background people have in the different models of disability. Um, usually most people stick to the medical model versus the social model. Medical model meaning that a disability is the same as an impairment, which means that a person is disability is uh, caused by their medical problem that should be fixed through therapies and interventions. Social model being no, it's society that disabled somebody. If the world were only constructed in a way that was accessible, nobody would be disabled. Those aren't the only two. The social model can be really helpful because it says, hey, it's not an us problem, it's a you problem. Um, it, it, maybe you guys should change something so our lives are easier. And hey, what's it to you anyways? We all benefit or at least you lose nothing. There's another model called the diversity model, which says there can be both. There can be actual medical problems that people subjectively will experience a benefit from and want um, because some conditions just plain suck. Like nobody, including me, with, that I've ever met with epilepsy wants to have a seizure. I have not come across anybody who enjoys having seizures. And there are other things, sometimes part of the same disabilities that you want to address in some cases that you really like about other things, like somebody with ADHD might take Adderall but they, and to fix the inattentiveness, but they really love the hyper focus when they get into something. Um, and so the diversity model blends those two things. One thing I don't think we talk about quite as much, and I think uh, people sometimes talk about it, as if it was a thing of the past, is the moral model, the idea that disability is a moral failing. It's either, that's either your parents did something terrible and you're a punishment from God, or you did something and that's why you ended up in this condition. And, or alternately, to be disabled by your impairment, to not overcome it, is a moral failing. And that, I think, is much more prominent. It might not have the religious connotation that it used to have in the past, but there's definitely a sense of you must 
right well you must be productive you must not show that you were harmed you must not be weak otherwise you you're just dis- or to put it in a way that it's often put um in the culture at large the only disability is a bad attitude the idea that you disable yourself and your experience of hardship is your own fault has a result and i think that that's profoundly damaging as damaging as the diversity perspective is helpful to us take it away lydia autistic people on average die 30 years younger than non autistic people and suicide is the second leading cause of our deaths. I don't think that that is an accident. And that's pretty horrifying for me to think about, but it's the reality in our community. And whether it is because we're constantly bombarded by the medical model or the moral model, or what we talk about often as the charity model, the pity model of disability that treats us as people who need to be saved and rescued and helped by the helping helpers who help, who come in with their beneficence and their angelic martyr-like motivations to keep us from being either treated badly or to make themselves feel better about themselves because they once said something not insulting, at least on its face to us, assuming that we can never tell that someone is pretending to be our friend or taking us on a pity date or calling us the R slur, but just without saying the R slur. And when you're subjected to those things, bombarded by them constantly, yeah, it makes sense that such a huge number of us experience suicidality and that such a huge number of us ultimately act on it in a way that results in death by suicide. And for me in particular, always thinking about what it means for disabled people who are at the margins of the margins, I and Shane also belong to the trans and the queer communities. And those are also communities where the rates of suicidality and of acquired mental health disability or psychosocial disabilities are often astronomical, whether because of childhood trauma or adult trauma or the combination of those or collective trauma or intergenerational trauma is just so much that when people who live at the intersections of more than one form of marginalization exist in a world that tells you you don't do ex- you don't deserve to exist as who you are. You don't belong here. You are a burden. You contaminate the population. You undermine the population. You drag everybody down. You hold everybody back. You are a threat and a menace to the rest of the population. You are dangerous. You are scary. You're weird and a freak and nobody will ever take you seriously for who you are. And that's what you're told constantly because you're queer, because you're autistic, because you're both. Who knows what it, what reason it really is? Because maybe it's all of those. And in fact, it usually is. No matter what words the people who say and believe and act on these things actually use, then yes, it makes perfect rational sense why so many of us struggle so deeply with suicidality, often in a very chronic way and often in a very passive way. And I don't think that enough people that provide mental health support, including peers, always talk about that particular form of suicidality, where suicidality isn't always one specific incident of crisis or an isolated moment that has a particular beginning, a middle, and an end. But sometimes for many of us, we might say we are constantly in crisis. What does it mean or feel like even to not be in crisis? What does it feel like not to feel like you shouldn't exist? What does it feel like not to feel like that existing is just more painful than anything else that could possibly happen. And in you live your life constantly being traumatized and re-traumatized everywhere and particularly and most painfully from those that are supposed to be supportive and helpful, then yes, it makes sense that so many of us struggle with not knowing what it means to not have those feelings. Hudson? Uh, I I would just add in one of the things I think that was really eye opening to me um, was the difference for Anders when it was um, when we were in a uh, in a school system um, or even just even even just, you know, more or less the culture of where we live that was not really geared towards wanting him to succeed, that it was geared towards wanting to manage him. Um, It wasn't something that was really geared towards how can he thrive? It was just make sure he survives. 
when we got to California, uh, it was such a vastly different experience um, to sit down with you know school psychologists and to do the the testing and to have them really empathize and understand. And it was, I think, the best metaphor that I can say is that you know. I've seen like flashes of of what I call like core Anders at times where you can see like he's completely comfortable, he's relaxed, he's 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 engaged, and you can see these just amazing insights of how his brain works in different ways. But a lot of the times it's it's hidden by fear, by uh, rejection. Um, I tell you, nothing will break your heart so much like you know a three or four year old telling you how sad they are that their friends don't want to be near them or that they can't you know fit in. Uh, and then seeing him, I mean, you know, pre-corona, um, finally hit uh, a stride, finally get um, with a teacher that got him, with uh, kids that were supportive, with a school environment that worked for him, and, and figuring out all the things that really made it so that he could just launch. And it was, um, it was beautiful. He, he, the things he was doing and saying and, and participating in was just amazing. And so it's just to me, it's th- those different types of models around disability even just at a young age, um, are so impactful and important. Um, it's it's incredible how how much they can impact someone's life. Joel, um, how might different models of disability and identity factor into extreme distress or suicidality in the autistic population? Um, so, you know. I, sorry, I had to think for a minute. Um, so I'm definitely gonna uh, criticize generally, uh, you know, not everywhere, but a lot of people that I've run into in uh, suicide prevention uh, emphasize you have autism um, and we need to change that. And that's bullshit. Um, I'm autistic. If I was not autistic, I would be a very fucking different person and I'm great, so we got to stop that shit. Um, how people can support me is to emphasize the things are, that are good about me, support me in what I need, and not tell me these things don't exist or that it's not a part of me, it's not part of who I am. And that's always been incredibly, incredibly harmful to deny someone the label that they identify with and tell them, no, you are wrong about who you say you are. Um, So that's first. (laughs) Second, um, I can say that I am disabled, but also appreciate my existence. And we need to move away from that kind of thing where it's disabled people are less worthy or are less valuable, um, are less important. Uh, I definitely, think that I've been way more disabled by society and by how people respond to me or choose to listen to me or not than by anything that is inherently going on in my brain. And that's always how it's been. I just didn't have the words for it until maybe four or five years ago where I realized there's nothing really like inherently wrong with me. I'm different and I have things that need a little more support, but who the fuck doesn't? And there's also a lot of denial about um, the rates of suicidality, the constantly distressful experiences like Lydia was talking about, um, how much extreme distress we fucking go through like every day. And then we're told how we deal with that distress is not acceptable. Um, And I think that's all I can say right now. (laughs) My brain's not working great because I'm not feeling well. So this is a struggle for me, but I'm glad to be here. No worries. Even Joelle at half capacity is still a million times more smarter than 99.9%. Basically everyone but the other people in this panel, which I all appreciate. Question number four. The final question, but certainly not the final frontier. And that would be... How can suicide and extreme distress be reduced in autistics by systemic change? Take it away, Shane. Shane, you're muted. 
really it will take a fundamentally different approach to dealing with autistic people interacting with us, conceiving of us to happen. It will take neurotypical people using the empathy they claim to have in much greater amounts than we do and applying it to us, really thinking, using that theory of mind idea of being able to imagine how other people act on a mass scale and teaching other people to do it enough that it becomes second nature to think about how an autistic person, especially autistic children who are just coming into their first school experience or their first time in a crowded public place or whatever else, what would that feel like? What would I want from a, from a support person or a parent or a teacher? Um, how would I convey this on to the other neurotypical children, um, siblings, classmates, etc.? If I were this kid, how would I, what would I want? And to act on that, I mean, in general, a greater amount of empathy would do wonders for the society and we're seeing the full effects of a society that, if anything, trashes empathy by, as an extension of its trashing weakness and vulnerability. Um, that idea that people have that being a victim means you're bad, that you're weak, that you deserve what happens for it to you if you're in any way marginalized and come to harm because of it. Turning that on its head and saying, and really internalizing that if you benefited from where you are, if, if, you, if, if you've been just lucky enough to end up at the top of the heap, um, either because of some combination of effort and luck, then you have the responsibility to use that to at least do no more harm to anybody else from their perspective and really to make things better for those who come after you, especially those who would struggle most. So it, ha it would be a matter of turning our kind of cultural framework on its head and working towards a completely different outcome or an, or the outcome, well, it depends on whether a person believes that everybody should be able to succeed or at least get what they need or not, either working towards a different outcome, which is that, or working more effectively towards it, which means helping people on an individualized basis and seeing their worth as they are rather than imposing one's own expectations and beliefs, believing that it's either for their own good or it's the only way to do things, that's how it is, etc. Um, I hope that answers the question in a coherent way. No, and I, I appreciate you tackling these very uh, weighty questions. So thank you, Shane. Now let's get Lydia's take. This is Lydia. When I think of what systemic change looks like, that means shifts massively in our legal, juridical, medical, and psychiatric structures, but it also means fundamental shifts in, the, in our culture and in the values that we hold in that culture and in our society. I, I've been reading the comments that have been coming through, some from Facebook, but a lot of them from Twitter. Um, I want to address some of the things that I see in those comments because that's part of the answer to this question. In shifting the values that we hold, what many of us are pushing for as disabled activists is not to stop thinking about disability or to stop labeling us as being disabled or to do away with references to what disability means, because that would also be erasing our cultures. It would be erasing our communities. It would be erasing our histories. And it would be erasing a point of what for many of us can be pride and can be empowerment at the same time as it can also be pain and distress. And those things are not incompatible. And my disabilities are not incompatible with my personhood or with my humanity. And so often folks who believe, and in very good faith, that they're being progressive or even radical will talk about how we should stop using the word disability. We should say differently abled, or we should say different abilities, or we should just say people of various ability statuses, or that we should just look at a world in which, and one person made this comment as well, that we should just all treat each other the same way. 
And, you know, there's a really brief explanation in response to that in that when we talk about justice, another word for that is equity. And a lot of people mistake equity for equality. But equality is never the same thing as justice, because taken at face value, equality means, for example, there's one entrance to the building, it has stairs to it, everyone goes to the same door, we're treating everybody the same. That's equal, but it's not fair. Because for people who struggle with stairs, or who can't use stairs at all, they can't even get in the building. The building exists, there's one door, but the folks who can't use the stairs are completely excluded from being able to get into that building. So to treat everybody the same, or to say, let's treat people equally, actually erases the distinctions between different people. And that's true within and across disabled communities as well. There are autistic people out there who desperately need a lot of types of social interaction, including on the phone. And there are a lot of autistic people out there, probably some that are watching this right now, who are like, what the fuck? Autistic people who use the phone? Because there's a huge number of us for whom the phone is anathema. Um, and there are a lot of us who need very little social interaction, or in the case of one of my friends, can live very happily with no in-person social interaction at all for a very long time. And so to say, well, we should treat all autistic people equally ignores the actual differences between us and it ignores the differences between us and people who aren't autistic at all. And that is actually to everybody's detriment, because if you expect people who don't function well in one environment to just somehow be able to function in it because you decided that it was the middle or some middle ground for everyone, you've done everybody a disservice. And so that mindset translates more broadly into society in, into our inability to address structural and systemic forces, like what ableism means as a whole value system. Part of how ableism operates is it reinforces the message that disability is bad, negative, detrimental, detracting from humanity or from personhood or the ability to be recognized as a person. And if disability is bad, then we either have to eliminate disability or we have to eliminate disabled people, or we have to rhetorically erase the idea of disability. And none of those things are good outcomes or good options for me. And for me and Shane and I, we've talked about this a lot and Shane spoke to it a little bit earlier. When I say recognize my personhood as a disabled person, you know, I'm not saying reduce me down to only my disability, let alone to stereotypes or prejudices about my disability. But I am saying that my disability does define me. It's part of what makes me who I am. Just as being queer is part of what makes me who I am and being East Asian is part of what makes me who I am and being a writer is part of what makes me who I am. All of those things do define me and so do many others. And to recognize me as a person and as a human, you have to recognize what my race is, what my disability is what my sexuality is, and what my passions are, what my personality is like. If you don't recognize those things as part of innate and integral to me, then you do not actually recognize my humanity. And so at a broader scale, what systemic changes we can be working toward in what might decrease distress and suicidality among autistic people can include a value shift that values us not despite being autistic and not, well, although we are autistic or as people separate from autism, but for being autistic people for better or worse for the things that about being autistic, that can be great and fun and exhilarating. And for the things about being autistic that we struggle with, that cause it to, that causes distress that are painful because they're all part of who we are. They are all part of our human experiences. Um, if our society moves in that direction, then yes, if that translates into how we actually run the educational system, how we actually provide services and supports both in crisis and long term, into how we actually make support available for housing, for employment, for just being able to be around each other, then yeah, I think that would make a huge fucking difference. Hudson? Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize what Shane said about empathy and really starting to, to focus on it and teach it. The, the concept of perspective taking, I think, is something that's so unbelievably lost um, on our kids and adults. Um, so I think that at kind of that macro level is starting to teach that. Um, on the on the mezzo level, like that midway level, I think it's it's starting to normalize a lot of the things that kids need to feel 
uh, comfortable, to feel secure, to feel safe, to not feel overwhelmed, you know, whether it's auditorily or light wise. Uh, I have a friend whose kid had to get an IEP to wear earbuds and or to wear earplugs in class because the sounds overwhelming. But like, think about like what she had to go through to then just get something that could make it so that she could be present. And so those types of things I think are really key. And then, you know, the last one I would say is kind of like my call to action um, to parents. Um, this one's always hard to talk about is invite, invite all the kids to your kids' birthday parties, invite them to any kind of party. Like I will tell you that if you want to reduce suicidality and anxiety and depression uh, and pain in, in kids, including them is a wonderful way to do it. Um, having sat with my kid crying when he didn't get invited to a kid's birthday party, I make a point to invite every possible kid I can. You know, if it's big and we have to figure out ways to make goldfish stretch to 30 kids, we'll do it. But like include um, as, a, as a default, make that the normal that if they can come, they, they're, they're welcome and they're, and you, you do things that are accepting and engaging with them. Um, and I'd say the last piece is kind of uh, yes, ending off of what you said, Lydia, is be the ally that the community needs, not the one that you think they need. And I think that that's a super important distinction. Um, as as an as as someone that I would call myself an ally to to the community, I work really hard to provide the support that my friends uh, and family need that are in it, not what I think they need. So, thank you, Hudson, Joelle. How can suicide and extreme distress be reduced in autistics by systemic change? Um, I have to, you know, I guess repeat. Uh, what was said about, you know, a cultural shift. Um, we don't, and this is not just autism, this is this is the disability community in general, there tends to be more emphasis on interdependence. And that's not that doesn't signify some kind of failing. Um, whereas, you know, being autistic, people want you to be independent, people want you to act like someone else, people want you to do all these things that do not come inherently and then and also do not serve us. Um, and what's interesting is actually during this pandemic, I've seen a lot of people practicing and valuing interdependence because it serves them. But when we fucking do it, we're like not good enough, where it's some sort of failing. It's, it's not the best way to be. The best way to be is to allow people to do things that serve them. And, you know, systemically... <laughs> Hudson. <laughs> I heard a pig, sorry. Um, so systemically, I have to say, I have run into so many fucking problems just accessing any kind of medical care. And part of that is the OCD. Um, part of that is my sensory issues. Like I can sit there in extreme pain and tell somebody I'm in extreme pain. And immediately I am suspect. I'm not trying to get care. I'm trying to manipulate the system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So systemically, we need to change what our systems are for. They're not to, they're not to oppress and control, they shouldn't be to oppress and control people. They should be to serve people in ways that they can be, that they can have a quality of life. And I, I rarely see that happen. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm very overwhelmed right now. Um, and also just in terms of accessibility, uh, Lydia was talking about equality versus equity. And you know, when we talk about accessible spaces, accessible things, we need to think more about a universal design. So you make it accessible to everyone you possibly can, not just one person who needs a ramp. And then you move the ramp. Like we need to make the world a more open, accessible place for everyone, um, how they need it. So that's as far as I can get right now. All right, thank you, Joelle. We have officially gone into overtime. So usually I have, I have time to address all the comments and tweets. So let me just make a blanket statement. You are all awesome. Everyone who participates in SBSM chat every Sunday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. I love you all. One of the most well-educated audiences out of all of live streaming shows on social media about suicide prevention. 
Awesome <laughs> work, everyone. Yes, yes. So um, we'll go into, let's go into final thoughts. Actually, um, I don't mean to interrupt, Lydia. So uh, let me just uh, give you the floor. This is Lydia. This is not an actual final thought, but is that actually a pig in Hudson's lap? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hi, Lydia. My name is Hamlet. That is an adorable pig, and I want to cuddle that pig. I would love to cuddle you. Tell me again what state you're quarantining in. California. Okay, next time I'm in California, when it's safe to be there, can I come meet your pig? Yes, please, but I don't like bacon. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's a reason why why the pig comes out last. Otherwise, we would just be completely derailed and just like swoon over Hamlet for the entire hour. But uh, let's let's get back to final thoughts and let's go to Shane and uh, and Shane and Lydia. Feel free to promote anything you got going on. Help people can connect with you as well during this final thoughts section. Take it away, Shane. <laughs> What I would say, kind of going off of what Joelle said earlier um, about pain control, and um, but extending more generally is, believe people when they tell you about the support they need. Believe people when they say that hurts me or I need this kind of support, like the earplugs that Hudson was mentioning. Um, if you can't give them what they need because you're one person, you don't have the resources, whatever, at least validate them. One of the things that can lead to suicidality is just a feeling of there's no way out of this. There's no stop button on any of this or any way to get what I need. There's no, I can't even imagine what that would look like to be able to access that, where I would be if that were the case. And that's a dangerous place to, teach somebody that they're in so do your best to if not give people the support they need then at least to let them know that their needs are valid that you would help them and that you're on their side um maybe not no matter what there are some instances you shouldn't be on somebody's side but as far as their support needs that that you have their back um also um, it's pretty easy to find me on social media if you remember the spelling of my name. Um, there's only one of me in the entire world, so it should make me, make it pretty easy. I'm Shane M. Newmeyer on Facebook, so the middle initial is M like Mary or Mahaffey in this case, and then S. M. Newmeyer is my Twitter handle for whenever I check my Twitter, which is not very often. Um, you can find me there, and um, I look forward to seeing you there. Good night. Thank you so much, Shane Newmeyer. Final thoughts, Lydia? This is Lydia. I want to thank you so much for hosting us and having this conversation. I am... I'm just always thinking about how many, like I said, of our community members are in crisis now and in constant crisis. And um, Shane and I talked about this recently too, but we've thought about what will happen if the period of quarantine and physical distancing needs to continue for longer. And if we will see an increase in suicidality, both chronic and acute in large numbers of people. And I think of course, those of us who belong to already marginalized communities have already and will continue to be experiencing that in a much greater extent. And I am deeply worried for what happens when those who have more power and privilege and resources decide that they wanna go back to quote unquote normal when what was normal to begin with was already unsustainable and already incredibly harmful at an interpersonal as well as a very collective level. And I'm hoping that the more of us work to actively fight against those forms of harm by building alternatives, whether that's like folks like Yuri Kim in Chicago that are building alternatives to calling the police or Mariama Kaba's work on transformative justice, Mia Mingus works in that area a lot, or whether it's the work that Agilsa Fernandez is, is leading now in creating a disability hotline for advocacy during COVID-19 or the work that 
Jay Salazar and Dana Garza are doing now with the Disability Justice Culture Club's mutual aid project in the East Bay, that we will see more and more of that work being done and being lifted up and supported by those who have the privilege to do so. And if we make that the norm, then maybe we have a chance of creating something better. So you can find me on Twitter. I've been tweeting a little bit to this conversation or retweeting it. My handle appears on screen at Autistic Hoya, H-O-Y-A. You can also find me under my name, Lydia XZ Brown, publicly on Facebook. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see all of my quarantine cooking. And if you tune in Tuesday night in just two nights at, at 7 o'clock Eastern, and that's 4 o'clock West Coast time, we're hosting a panel that I'm moderating. Shane is one of the panelists, and the other two are Jay and Dana, who I just mentioned, speaking on mutual aid and eugenics and medical rationing in COVID-19 for disabled people. Um, we hope that you'll tune into that. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Lydia. I appreciate you. I reached out to you out of the blue and you graciously accepted my invitation to talk about very, very serious subject matter, but one that needs to be talked about, especially in the month of April. So I'm glad we were able to give a actually autistic perspective Thank you again. What say you, Hudson, final thoughts? Uh, Shane, just a quick heads up. Sometimes Hamlet squeals when he gets excited. Um, I, I, there's not really much that I could add. What are you doing? There's not really much else that I could add off of what uh, Shane and Lydia uh, said uh, and Joelle. Uh, I, I do just want to say, Joelle, how unbelievably proud I am of you. I know that this wasn't the easiest one to do. Um, I'm proud of you and also thankful for you being my friend and teaching me so much. Um, about my own little kid and how to navigate. Um, so I brought I brought Hamlet's favorite uh, treat today in from the garden uh, for SPSM. He loves to eat roses. They're his favorite thing. And so I brought roses as my final thought. Uh, I appreciate all of you out there. I know that this is hard, um, but it's going to get better and we're going to get through this together. Take care of each other and uh, be the ally that uh, those around us need. Get it, buddy. Oh. Thank you, Hudson. I can't put into words how much I miss you and hanging out with you and eating barbecue, drinking wine. It will happen again. I promise you that. It will. All right. Final thoughts, Joelle. Um, yeah, I guess. Thank you for the Hamlet treat. Um, I think just a couple things that I think are just... Uh, I'm having a really hard time. Um, so I definitely saw some some tweets that uh, kind of criticized the criticism of the helpers. And I have to say, if we are identifying someone as a helper and that's all we know about them and that's all they want known about them, I'm going to criticize that. <laughs> I'm going to criticize the shit out of it because their identity or their claim to fame rests on helping and they're going to determine what that help is by what they think, not by listening to us. So that's the first thing. Um, also, you know, I think uh, when we did first tweet this out, we tweeted out um, Autism Awareness Month. And really, uh, I can't speak for all autistics, certainly. Um, I really appreciate autism acceptance much more because it's one thing to be aware that a thing exists. It's another to truly appreciate it and engage and um, make it valued. So accepting something goes a long way towards valuing something and that's gonna value me as an autistic. Uh, one more thing, don't tell me what my label is or how I identify, it's unacceptable. Don't do it to anybody, done. Thank you, Joelle. I appreciate you. You kicked ass and I love you. So thank you for all you do. And thank you to everyone who watched. And of course, thank you to Lydia and Shane, our awesome, awesome guest of honor. Thank you to Hudson who had to go. And that's going to do it. Oh, I want to make sure that we got the uh, website on there, artistichoya.net. That way you can learn and keep in touch and read a lot about uh, Lydia's work. So go check that out next week. We've got a good one for you. Let's get this final thoughts graphic off. We've got a good one. So 
Dr. April Foreman, who is the creator of SPS MChat, Suicide Prevention Social Media, the show that you're watching right this second, is going to be our guest. But worry not, she is not coming alone. She is going to be bringing back the original SPS MChat crew. So please, 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 that's going to be a special one. Of course, they, uh, well, not of course, but to me, um, the American Association of Suicidology Conference is taking place next week as well. So they're all involved with it as, as well as me. But don't worry, if you have no clue what that conference is and do not care or hate that conference, we still got things for you. So we'll be talking about the state of suicide prevention as a whole, both good and bad, mostly bad, because that's just the way the world is working right now. So until next week.